You hear a lot about undernourished children in Africa, but there's a more persistent problem. Millions of children are too short. Their growth faltered, and they failed to reach their height potential. Stunting is the gateway to poor health later in adulthood. Stunting leads to obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. <laughs> stunting lowers cognitive function, and stunted children tend to get less education. That leads to lower paying jobs. As if this wasn't bad enough, stunting shortens the lifespan. In most countries in sub-Saharan Africa, 40% of children are stunted. In India, there's a similar percentage of stunted children. What's truly tragic is that stunting gets passed to the next generation. Stunted mothers tend to have stunted daughters, and the cycle repeats itself. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six children. They're all from the same year, which is 2012. This is the oldest, and this is the youngest. And there's two little girls I want to point out. This one is Isa. This one is Yadomu. And Isa is stunted. Our research group is trying to understand the biological mechanisms behind this mother-to-daughter transmission. To do this, we're looking at the activity of genes in the placenta. We're asking, does a mother's history of stunting reset her genes so that her offspring are also stunted? Answering this question will hopefully make it possible to stop stunting, which is the root cause of so many health problems. So is this the organism that causes schistosomiasis or bilharzia? Yeah. Kind of the life cycle where it goes through snails and, because that's super prevalent yeah. in the Dogan area. Because I mean, this is, yeah. They walk in this water that's stagnant and uh, it's just. But it shouldn't be in placenta. That's very it's, it's that's rare. unusual. Yeah. My background is in evolutionary biology and anthropology. What I brought to the table was a 20-year study of child growth in Africa. I'm a molecular biologist. Beverly and I decided to team up to collect molecular data on the children she has been studying for so long. Our common desire was to understand human biology through the lens of evolution different transcripts um, be behave differently, have different biases, mm -hmm. and, 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 and genes, uh, that's the complexity of biology, don't just produce one transcript. I think in humans, on average, each gene produces like 10 transcripts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To study the epigenetic causes of stunting, it made most sense to focus on the placenta. The placenta is the organ that controls the transfer of nutrition from the mother to the fetus. It used to be assumed that interactions in the womb were totally harmonious. Thanks to the evolutionary biologist David Haig, we now know that pregnancy is rife with conflict. The fetus is in a battle with the mother over how much nutrition should cross the placenta. David Haig also described another battle that plays out during pregnancy. This one is between the mother's genes and the father's genes in the placenta. You'd think that the two sets of genes cooperate with each other to ensure the best possible nutrition for the growing baby, and that the genes from the two sets of parents share the same end goal. But that's not the case. Instead, there's a tug of war between the genes from the mother and the genes from the father over how much food the fetus should get. It benefits the woman's genes to divvy up her resources between her present fetus and her future children. The father's genes don't care if a woman's body gets depleted. They want to tap her for all she's worth. 
the father's genes are short-sighted because over evolutionary history, there was a strong possibility that he might be displaced by another man who steps in to father her future children. David Haig used this kind of reasoning to explain a phenomenon called genomic imprinting. In the case of the ordinary genes, both the mother's and the father's copies are active, with 50% of the expression coming from the mother's copy and 50% of the expression coming from the father's copy. In the imprinted genes, there's a skew such that one parent's copy is more active. If a gene in the placenta is growth promoting, then only the father's copy is active and the mother's copy is silenced. If a gene is growth inhibiting, then it's the reverse. Only the mother's copy is active and the father's copy is suppressed. David Haig suggested that this pattern is the outcome of the conflict between the mother's genes and the father's genes over how much nutrition should go to the fetus. The baby will get less nutrition from the mother if a growth promoting gene is suppressed. From the point of view of a gene that comes from the mother, that's a good thing. But from the point of view of a gene that comes from the father, a growth-promoting gene should be fully active. I realized that imprinted genes in the placenta are the ones that matter for growth. So I suspected that they are responsible for transmitting stunting from mothers to daughters. We test this idea at Beverly's field site in West Africa. There we have the opportunity to collect placental tissue from mothers who are stunted and mothers who are not stunted. The people at the field site belong to the Dogen ethnic group. The Dogen live along the Bandiagara cliff in central Mali. The cliffs have sheltered them from raiders who used to try to snatch people as slaves or convert them to Islam. Their villages are architecturally scenic and have been designated a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site. Dogen are world-renowned for the mass dances that they perform during funerals. At these times, they also fire their flintlock rifles. The Dogen are a farming people, and they grow millet as their staple crop. In the dry season, they also grow onions as a cash crop. Weaving cotton is another source of income. The Dogen live just south of the Sahara Desert in a region of rock and thorn savanna. The soil is poor and the rainfall is unpredictable. Droughts and plagues of locusts contribute to the food insecurity. Anyarabia, Anyarabia, Umu Ino, Ne U Kisinje, as by Yanabo. Mubara, yeah, who on the other one, yeah. Bella, Bella, who are Mubara, me, Ada, who Mubu, Bao. Women have about nine children, and in many families, there's too many mouths to feed. In the 1980s, about half of all children died by age five. Child mortality levels have improved in the Dogen, but about 50% of children are still stunted. In Africa overall, child mortality levels have gone down, but stunting has persisted. Our study tracks three generations. 
The main one includes 1,700 children whom we followed from infancy and early childhood. The survivors are now in their late teens and early 20s. Every year, just about, since 1998, we've measured their height, weight, and other aspects of their nutritional status. Transing. Mm -hmm. We also record their blood pressure and other data on their family environment. Mm -hmm. Saliva samples enable us to collect DNA. We enrolled the children's parents in our study and have also measured them. When the children themselves become parents, a third generation gets added. Molly is known for a high rate of teenage pregnancy, and the girls usually become pregnant before age 20. Before they go into labor, we ask for permission to collect a few grams of tissue from their placentas. We use these tissue samples to measure the activity of the imprinted genes. We expect that the genes that promote growth will be less active in the placentas from the mothers who were stunted in childhood. The genes that inhibit growth should be more active in the stunted mothers. We are fortunate that most of the young women and their families agree to participate. Our goal is to sample 600 placentas. The placentas can't come from just any woman. They have to be from those we've been measuring for 20 years. Three Dogen midwives collaborate with us at the maternity clinic at our field site. They know the names of all of the women in our study, and when one of these women shows up in labor, then our research team springs into action. This can be at any time of the day or the night. After delivery of the baby and the placenta, a midwife collects three milliliters of umbilical cord blood. The midwife cuts the placenta. She dissects out a small amount of fetal tissue. She puts the tissue in a tube that has a buffer solution to wash away any blood. She also scrapes off a bit of the maternal tissue. Then she transfers the tissue to a tube that has a solution that helps to stabilize RNA. RNA is the molecule that we're using to measure gene activity. She collects a small amount of fetal tissue to test for malaria and other problems that might have complicated the pregnancy. This sample goes into a tissue cage and then is preserved in formaldehyde. The midwife collects tissue from the umbilical cord for analysis of the fetal DNA. While one midwife dissects the placenta, another midwife is in charge of the delivery. The safety of the mother and the baby always has priority. One of the midwives shares data with us on the baby's birth weight and length and other important indicators of health. The, the baby's APSGAR score at the first minute after birth was 9, and at the second minute after birth was 10. So he's doing fine. And the expulsion of the placenta was normal because it was uh, it happened in less than 45 minutes after the birth. After the dissection, the placenta is returned to the family for burial. In the Dogen, there's no special ceremony surrounding the placenta. If the mother and her family agree, 
then the newborn becomes part of our study. The baby is measured at birth, age one month, and then three times per year. We plan to keep this up for 10 years. Donc, évidemment, c'est un cycle vicieux qui existe déjà. Une femme qui est de, de courte taille, qui accouche d'un enfant, généralement de petits poids de naissance. Donc, si les conditions ne sont pas réunies, cet enfant en elle-même peut devenir petit poids de naissance et peut devenir courte. Giru Diko ah. is the only Donc, doctor at the hospital Donc, at our field site. Incredibly, he serves a population of over 50,000 people. He's very Ensuite, dedicated tâchons, to the health of this remote community. La petite fille qui est là, elle est, elle est, elle est née par une mère malnutrie. Donc elle, à la naissance aussi, elle, est, elle, elle, elle fait une malnutrition chronique. Donc elle, est, elle grandit avec ça, il n'y a pas une bonne croissance. Donc peut-être les, les, les organes ne sont pas bien développés, tout ça. Donc, là, Madeleine Goita is the most experienced midwife. She's very aware of the tendency for stunting to get transmitted from mothers to daughters. Jacari Dolo is our field manager. He directs the Dogen field team year-round. Jacari lives in the village that I began studying 30 years ago, and I've known him since he was a little boy. Everyone respects Jacari, and he always gets the job done right. We have solar-powered freezers at our study site, and that's where we store the placental samples. Periodically, we ship the samples on dry ice to my laboratory in the United States. The samples begin their journey on the back of a motorcycle. Then they're loaded onto the market truck. The truck travels southwest for 500 miles and reaches the Malian capital of Bamako the next morning. Then the box of samples flies to Casablanca and on to the U.S. This is that same box, you know, like that it and it, it it's collected in the village and then it ends up here in the lab. When the samples reach the University of Michigan, they're stored in the freezer in my laboratory in the Department of Anthropology. So that's PFA from woman six twenty two. And here's her PFB. Okay, so um, this is uh, fetal material from the placenta from that birth. And then where's her fetal cord blood? Okay, here's the umbilical cord blood associated with that woman. Jenny Lovett is the lead laboratory technician working on the project. She isolates the RNA, which is the molecule that we're using to detect the activity of the genes. The RNA analysis that we're doing is really going to tell us uh, what's going on in the placenta at the moment of, or very soon around delivery. And we're looking specifically at growth genes, which are going to be important because they're an indicator of how well the mother is providing nutrition to her developing baby. Undergraduate students get research experience working in the laboratory. It's interesting to see what we can do with, you know, the proteins that we're analyzing and um, the genes that we're looking at to see if there's, um, first of all, what's going on in someone's, you know, with our processes that are going on inside our body and like seeing what we can do to maybe make things better. The placental tissue actually looks preterm. 
A placental so, pathologist works with an undergraduate student to find out if the growth of the child was affected by complications like malaria. You can see like how striking the hemozoan is against the rest of the stuff, so it's like a dark brown pigment. You can see it all over here, so it's really extremely present in this case. We're doing this to rule out factors other than imprinting that could contribute to stunting. RNA that Dr. Lovett purified goes to a core facility where it gets sequenced. So this transcript, for example, uh, this is anti-science IGF-2. Wei Xing Wu is the project's bioinformaticist, and oh, yeah. Dylan Sun is a graduate student. They scrutinize the massive amount of sequencing data on the activity of the imprinted genes. They seem to have different behavior, but they seem to be on the same transcript. So Analyzing the data is very computationally intensive, so they need to use massive parallel computing. On a regular server, um, it's quite, the, 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 the number of jobs you can run simultaneously is quite limited. That's when flux comes in. You can run like 100 jobs together at the same time. The goal is to see if we're right that the growth promoting genes are more active if they come from the father and that the growth inhibiting genes are more active if they come from the mother. More importantly, we want to know if this is especially true for the stunted mothers. If that's the case, then this could explain how stunting gets passed on. Our project is still ongoing, but we have accomplished many things and we are eager to continue. We have marshaled 20 years of longitudinal data on the Dogen and state-of-the-art molecular biology. We are asking theory-driven questions that are grounded in evolutionary biology. That's a powerful and unique approach. By understanding how stunting gets passed from mothers to daughters, we hope that down the road, our study will lead to interventions that allow millions of children to grow up healthy and to reach their full potential. We're doing basic science on how genes interact with the environment and on how health and disease is passed from one generation to the next. The biology we're studying doesn't just apply to the Dogen or people in Africa. Instead, it applies to all people. It would be tremendous if our study helps to create the knowledge not only to prevent stunting, but also to tackle the closely related problem of obesity. Like stunting, obesity is due to an interaction between the genes and the environment. Obese mothers are more likely to have obese daughters. In the United States, about one in three adults is obese. It's clear that we need to understand how obesity is transmitted across the generations. Whether we're talking about stunting or obesity, epigenetics is going to be an important part of the answer. It's an exciting time to be a scientist working on these global health problems.